Hello, good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay. We are having technical difficulties. This is the Foreign Press Association, and uh, this is the first, after a little bit of a gap of our webinars, we've had um, staffing problems. It's true the economy is overheating. We've recruited three people to do the Zooms, and they've each dropped out at the last minute, uh, not on ideological grounds, presumably because they had better offers. So I'm Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association, and our guest today is Eric Altervan, uh, with his book, We Are Not One, A History of America's Fight Over Israel. Uh, Eric has, um, and I share uh, many battle honors, uh, the nation, um, forward, uh, descent, the Guardian, uh, and many more on which we've uh, approached this issue and others. Uh, and each time we've had to confront, um, let us say, people with deep ideological prejudices and reflexive gestures uh, about who to support and not to support. So one of the distinguishing features of Eric's book is its objectivity. Um, all 500 pages of it, in which he's dissected the contentious issue of the American-Israel relationship, uh, which it's very difficult to um, approach in an objective way, because every word is loaded. Uh, is it an attack or is it a massacre? Is it a terrorist raid or self-defense? Um, you can't say you choose. But the people who use these words often do so advisedly, and the ones people who emulate them often do so without thinking of the implications, or in the words of Rabbi Burns, seeing us as others see us. So, you know, our dead children are worth more than your dead children, and our dispossession is more important than your dispossession. So these are the type of issues which I think Eric, uh, with some delicacy, Manages to um, navigate in the book. And it does come down to the great paradox how come a superpower like the US would appear to be enthralled to um, a small sort of bunch of fanatics and zealots on the edge of the Mediterranean and a not particularly fertile point? It's uh, any rumors of it being a land of milk and honey will soon be dispelled once once you visit there, especially if you get to the Galilee and West Bank and, and the Negev. So, uh, Eric, well, let's say, how is it, rather than how did your book start, how did it finish? It came just as the issues really heated up. How, how, how has the reception been so far? Oh, I didn't know you were going to ask me that. First of all, you know, the way you describe it, it, it reminds me of something I was saying the other day when I was talking with someone about the origin of the settlement process, what's, what's amazing, almost funny, but certainly ironic is that when we're talking about Hebron. I, I visited a, a settlement outside Hebron during the first intifada where the first Israeli child and the 200 something Palestinian child was killed and got to talking about Hebron and Hebron was the original place where the very first uh, settlement was founded illegally after the 67 war. And what the uh, fanatical settlers who later became the Gushamani did was they, they just walked into the city, said, we're taking this place over and said to the government, either you come protect us or we're gonna be killed. And so the government felt they had no choice to protect those people. And then eventually, the settlement was legalized and became part of the settlement process. And this happened over and over and over that the settlers were just declared that this was now their land and any Palestinians who lived near it could clear out. And, and the Israeli government eventually legalizes these settlements and protects them with the IDF retrospectively. The ironic thing is that that then drove American foreign policy because US foreign policy is is legally does not believe the settlements are legal and they wishes they would go away, but always ends up defending them in the UN and never really threatens Israel to get rid of them. And so these fanatical settlers, these religious 
zealots who believe that they're helping the Messiah to arrive are actually driving US foreign policy, a superpower, which is really something to think about. Anyway, um, to answer your question, uh, I think I, I keep saying two things about this book. One is it's the work, it's I've written 12 books, I've written thousands of columns. Uh, I've done other things. This is the thing I'm most proud of in my life. Like if you got a picture on your tombstone, this would be the picture. This is this is what I'm capable of. And there's nothing in the book. There, there's some, you know, tiny errors in the book, but there's nothing in, in the book I need to take back. Everything that's happened since the book was published since I turned it in, it's consistent with what was in the book. Um, I closed the book, I closed the writing of the book just as the Israeli government was falling um, and new elections were coming, elections that ended up being disastrous from the point of view of everyone except the far right in Israel. And, um, uh, and, uh, and of course, it, the track, the horrific events of October 7th and since, um, I wouldn't say I predicted them. I mean, I certainly didn't. Hamas shocked me, but the reaction to them is somewhere contained in the, the context for that. Uh, as for the reception of the book, I feel like it's been received by the people I wrote it for quite well. I have gotten some wonderful reviews. Um, I've gotten a lot of compliments from people I care about, but I'd say in the mainstream media, by and large, it's been ignored. Um, it hasn't been uh, reviewed in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Atlantic Monthly or the Nation or the New Republic or the New York Review of Books or the London Review of Books. Um, it was reviewed in the Washington Post by a person who is heavily criticized in the book and did not admit that in their review. Um, the Guardian wrote a nice review, but by and large, uh, I've been in, I've I've written twelve books. I'm deeply depressed by uh, how little reaction the book has gotten in the mainstream media. But I'm proud of the book. So there you are. Mm -hmm. That's uh, well, as I said, it's come. I've been writing about this for many years, and it really is. Uh, it I'm well aware how it's tiptoeing through a minefield where everything you say is uh, has got to be weighed. It's, it's not even a question of fact or otherwise, it's a question of degree. Like uh, Bernie Sanders is calling for humanitarian pause and I can almost hear already people accusing him of being a sellout for not calling for a ceasefire, which is of course what he means, but he's framing his language for the audience, I'm sure. Um, in fact, Bernie Sanders has come quite a long way because this was a, a third rail issue for many years. Yeah. Um, well, it so I'm, happens that Bernie Sanders' top advisor is a man was a man named Matt Duss, who uh, I worked with at the Center for American Progress, and he left there because he didn't feel comfortable there and became head of the Foundation for Middle East Peace for a while before going to work for Bernie. And he gave me a grant. They, they gave me a grant for this book and Matt was very helpful. So I would say that, you know, Bernie's a politician. So he's got to be careful about how he phrases things to some degree. But I would say that uh, this book is perfectly consistent with um, what, what would lead to politics like Bernie's. I mean, Bernie is not an anti-Zionist. He's someone who's saying that there are people on, there are actual people on both sides and they deserve to find a we need to find a way to help all of them live in lives of peace and dignity. And that's not happening. And the book isn't explicitly or exclusively about the attitude of uh, the progressives to Israel. But that's one of the most fascinating bits, the way that's changed within my lifetime and presumably yours. Whereas uh, when I was a precocious kid growing up, then kibbutzim looked like they were the socialist future. And so Israel looked like the socialist future. And I remember being puzzled by what was, why were they fighting with NASA, who was fighting British imperialism in sewers? Why were they fighting alongside the British against NASA? And it was only much later that things became clearer. And later on, you discover, you notice that people found it 
very difficult to believe that our Israel would be on the side of South Africa. Well, first of all, I think we should clarify for people who are not familiar with the book. It's not another history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, of which I I say in like the very first words of the book, my shelves are groaning. It's from which um, it's a history of the debate in the United States over Israel and particularly Israel Palestine. Um, but you're right, Israel. When Israel was founded. Um, up to about 1967, primarily, it was seen as, Israel was seen as an anti-imperialist nation and was uh, beatified by the left. The, uh, the Palestinians who were expelled by Israel or who left voluntarily, most of whom were expelled, but some left voluntarily, um, they were seen as sort of the past. They were, they were, they were um, tools of British imperialism according to this analysis. And it was only after 1967, uh, when the new left turned, began to see the Palestinians as part of the revolutionary vanguard, and the Palestinians uh, started employing Marxist rhetoric in there uh, as part of their struggle, that the side switched. So leftists, by and large, came to support the Palestinians. Liberals, by and large, remained with Israel, oftentimes, being forced by Israel to choose between their liberalism and their Zionism, and for a long time, I would say at least up through 1982, stuck with their Zionism. And then since 1982, since Israel's invasion of Lebanon and the events of Sabra and Shatila and the siege of Beirut, things have gotten a lot messier. And it's, it's sort of almost like a case, case by case basis. I'm saying now Israel has become a conservative call. There's still many liberals in Congress who support Israel, and some, a few liberals, uh, who who choose Israel over the Palestinians, but by and large the Democratic Party is split in half, and moderates are pro-Israel, and the liberal left support more of the Palestinians. But there's also, I mean, there's a dilemma that uh, a dichotomy replicated worldwide is that the elites tend to be lend support to Israel, whereas the sort of the broader populations, like you've seen all across the Arab world and Europe, where governments have declared undying support for Israel, and the streets are filled with people begging to differ in a big way. I mean, one of the first casualties of this war is the Abrahamic Accords, obviously. Um, even the King of Morocco has uh, sort of had to trim his sails considerably because of uh, popular pressure from the Moroccan uh, population. Well, uh, we've seen Brooklyn here, and uh, I, I never thought I would see demonstrations like that in New York, for example. Yeah, well, these are different phenomena. Like I said, the left is anti-Israel by and large. It's almost impossible to say a nice word about Israel in the Nation magazine, for instance. Certainly in Jacobin, uh, which is to the left of the nation, it is impossible. Um, and, uh, you know, the Arab populists were never involved in the Abraham Accords. Those were always elite to elite deals. They were peace treaties between countries that had never been at war. They're basically military military sales agreements with uh, Sweden or the US, US uh, weapons thrown in. I never took them seriously as in terms of ending the conflict. Um, maybe a Saudi deal might have had more effect. But in, in my opinion, I, I have nothing let me be clear, the Hamas attack is, was indefensible morally. Uh, it was strategically kind of brilliant, but it's morally horrific and, and nothing Israel has done has, as awful as it's been can justify it. But if you're trying to explain it rather than justify it, it reminds me of the terrorist period of the 1970s where the Palestinians were saying, hey, we're here, we're living in under terrible conditions, the world has forgotten about us, um, and we're not going to let you do that. And even if we have to commit horrible acts to remind you of our existence, we're going to do that because we refuse to accept this fate. And, and you know, the terrorism was terrible and this act was terrible, but I think it, it was in part a response to the fact that the world felt it was moving on from the Palestinians. 
that that the first the Abraham Accords and then the Saudis, and then just the whole tenor of the Middle East, worrying much more about uh, Iran and and allying themselves either sub Rosa or in a few cases openly with Israel, were telling the Palestinians that this was going to be their fate forever, and the Palestinians saying, "No, it's not." So that's my explanation of that. Mm -hmm. um, now, in 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 the U.S. Uh... There's a lot of talk. I mean, th there's a lot of slippage between terms, as we know, anti-Zionism versus anti-Semitism, the Jewish lobby versus the Israel lobby, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the Jewish of... lobby is more Christian than Jewish. These guys, yes. the largest, <laughs> the largest pro-Israel organization is Citizens United for Israel, an evangelical organization run by. Uh, Reverend James Hagee, who once called Hitler a hunter for God. That's how crazy things are in this country. <laughs> well, you made that point because we had a bit of a dispute, uh, not a dispute, but a, 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 a conflab. The, many of the people who are now supporting Israel are actually, I think you made this point, uh, really anti-Semitic. They're saying that Jews should be com com converted or, or destroyed eventually <laughs> well the, the evangelical view it's it's actually i had you know most people sort of know this but if you look deeply into it it's it's really shocking to me anyway the evangelical viewpoint is that it's the it's necessary to gather the jews in israel so that the book of revelations can take place and ideally there will be a conflagration that will involve the united states and russia um and Iran, who stand in for Satan. Although I must say, uh, some of the evangelicals have named the president of the EU as Satan himself. Um, if, you and, read, if you read the Left Behind series, which I did in the cause of... Uh, yeah, it's, it's all there. It's, it's the secretary there. of the United Nations is the Antichrist. Right, sometimes it's the EU, sometimes it's the United... Anyway, so then this, this revel revelations will take place. And um, another word for that is Armageddon. And those who are saved will ascend to heaven, and those who aren't, including the Jews, will descend to hell. So the evangelicals are saying, we support you so that eventually you can end up in hell. And conservatives just say that's not a bad bargain, because we don't really think we're going to hell. We think that's kind of nuts. And in the meantime, we'll take the support. Um, uh, and from a pragmatic standpoint, if if in fact they they don't care about you know human rights or anything, they're right. You know who cares what Jerry Falwell or Pat Robertson think is going to happen in the afterlife. What matters is what happens today. And today, the evangelicals will support and defend absolutely anything the Israeli government does, except make peace. Well, the, we're getting to. Um... The speaker that we had lined up for next, once we got our staffing problems sorted, <clears throat> was in fact Masha Karp, who's written a book on Orwell in the Soviet Union. And it brings in an element here, which I think is uh, pervasive throughout your book and the whole discourse, is the idea of thought crime. Mm -hmm. A lot of the... Um, I think it was John Stewart had that little sketch where the minute he tried to say something, there was a cacophonous clap from either side shouting him down. And that's really been uh, one of the characteristics uh, which has got to a crescendo lately, that anybody who says anything that isn't 100% in support is going to get shouted down, called anti-Semite, uh, the brouhaha about poor Jeremy Corbyn in in Britain is is the case in point. Anyone who disagrees in the slightest is called anti-Semite, which can be a very expedient because often it's not because of their views on the Middle East at all. It's because they're politically disagreeing, and it's a very good handle to beat somebody with. But uh, th this idea of uh, excluding people that you cannot have a speaker who might have suggested that there's a case. And it reminded me, we, we don't have a partner for peace. For years, they refused to talk to Yasser Arafat and the PLO. And then they got a peace treaty 
Now it's Hamas. You cannot have any relations at all, even though, you know, you mightn't like them. We don't like them. But they are there and they are, you know, de facto in control. The European Union used to be much more pragmatic. They described them as a political organization with um, terrorist elements. But even the EU has been whipped in uh, and the British Foreign Office now. They are terrorists and we cannot talk to them. We managed to talk to Menachem Begin. We managed to talk to uh, Yitzhak Shamir and the other people who actually killed British servicemen, in fact. Um, but uh, th there are whole levels of thought crime that people cannot support and, and non-persons who can't be allowed anywhere near a campus. And I suppose the next part of it in the McCarthy era is loyalty oaths. Nobody is allowed to say a word unless they wholeheartedly condemn the Hamas atrocities, which implies that you're blaming Hamas for every single death there, regardless of some evidence that the IDF, uh, trigger happy IDF played a part in some of those deaths. So you're committing to a whole thing before you can say anything about the issue at all. Well, I agree with a lot of what you said, and I disagree with a lot of what you said. So I don't know if you want to go through all the details. Um, well, this I personally, I personally won't. I don't want any friends who won't condemn what Hamas did. I will talk to anyone to learn what I can from anyone or to pursue whatever good in the world I can. But if someone can't wholeheartedly condemn the murder and kidnapping and dismembering of people that Hamas did, like I said, there's no excuse for it. And that person, uh, they, their humanity is gone as far as I'm concerned. And also I haven't heard anything about IDF being responsible for anything. And I, I don't, I, until I see evidence for that, I don't believe it. Um, now on this whole partner for peace thing, it's kind of the Israelis ace in the hole. It's true they don't have a partner for peace. It's also true that that's largely of their own doing or significantly of their own doing. The Palestinian Authority is corrupt and non-representative and anti-democratic and uh, overly um, collaborationist for the taste of the population and hence has very little legitimacy with the Palestinians and therefore is not a partner for peace because they cannot deliver. Hamas, you can't make peace with Hamas. Uh, it's impossible. Um, so Israel has no partner for peace. So they're right when they say that. Now, the fact is, is that Israel has consistently undermined those people who would have legitimacy in the Palestinian community. Um, they've jailed, say, Margon Barghouti, who is someone who, who could have spoken across the ties between... Oh, and also there's the problem of the Palestinian Authority and Hamas practically being at war. If, if they had the chance, they would go to war with one another. Um, so the Palestinians are, are disunited and no one can speak for them. Um, so uh, again, the, Israel, the Israelis have promoted, they helped create Hamas, they have promoted Hamas because they thought that Hamas served their needs because they didn't want to make peace. The Israeli right, which has been in control of Israel since the second intifada in uh, 2000, 2001. Um, so, uh, yeah, Israel has never really, I mean, if you ask me, was peace ever possible? I would say a pretty, pretty excellent peace deal was reached or just about reached in Taba in 2007, 2008, not at Camp David with Barack, which is what all Americans say that, that that's overblown. And that, that was basically a Bantustan agreement that Arafat was unable to accept politically and and also he was right to turn it down from a strictly I mean he was wrong to turn it down because every time the Palestinians turn down an agreement the next offer is worse and they they should have built on what they were being offered since the 1920s in my opinion and certainly in 1947 um but uh but from Arafat's narrow Arafat was badly treated to the degree that you can treat Arafat badly in the deal that everyone says he should have made with Clinton and for two reasons. One is he didn't want to come. The 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 Camp David uh, meetings were very badly planned. He didn't think anything could come of it. He said, I will only come as a favor to you if you promise not to blame me if it doesn't work out. And it didn't work out and they blamed him first 
before he'd even like gotten to the airport. Um, and uh, one of the, um, the head of the Israeli foreign ministry, I believe his name is Shalom Ben Ami, but I might be wrong about that, who was a member of the negotiating team. He said, I would not have accepted this deal if I were Yasser Arafat. It was a bad deal. What's more, every time Arafat turned down an Israeli offer, he got a better offer. And in fact, Israel made a much better offer at Tabas, uh, an Egyptian city that Israel had given back to Egypt after 67, in 2007 under Ehud Omer. Uh, I, I am skeptical, it doesn't really matter what I think, but I'm skeptical that that deal could have been sold to the Israelis. And I'm also, I don't know if it could have been sold to the Palestinians and involved an awful lot of painful compromise for both sides. But we'll never know because Omer decided A, to go to war, in Gaza instead of presenting the Israelis with that deal. And B was then kicked out for being corrupt. Um, so uh, I'm one of those people who says there is a deal to be made. We've been we've just about there. We saw it at Tabo. It's the, the problem is entirely political. The problem is that you can't get to that deal and nobody knows how to do that. And so when people say, I still support the two state solution, like Joe Biden and Tony Blinken say, I said, well, what have you done to make sure the two-state solution is possible to reach? And the first thing you would have done as President Biden is you would have stopped the Israelis from terrorizing the Palestinians, the West Bank, and expanding the settlements and doing this sub rosa um, annexation. So uh, I had an argument with, with a State Department official just this weekend at a conference. It was actually in honor of my uh, late academic mentor, a historian named Walter Lefebvre. And he trained a lot of people who became U.S. officials. And he and I said, nobody believes that the two-state solution is possible anymore. And he says, well, Joe Biden believes it. And I said, I don't believe Joe Biden believes it. He's too smart to believe it. What Joe Biden believes in is not having a fight with Israel over the settlement expansion. And in order to avoid that, he pretends that there's a two-state solution. But if he really thought that, he would he would start, he would say no. You can't keep doing that, or we're, or we're not going to give you more and more money. And and he's not going to say that. no. No American president is going to say that. So the Israelis are really in control of that process, and the Israelis prefer the current situation to peace. Well, the current situation might possibly lead to well, it is leading to creeping annexation, and um, yes, well, it is. It is. It's a one-state solution already. Yeah, and ethnic dispossession. It's eth It's you know. It's a subterfugative um, ethnic cleansing going on. It is, and Hamas, Hamas's attack accelerated that enormously, both by weakening whatever was left of the Israeli peace camp, and second, taking people's eyes off the ball. Everybody's looking at Gaza and southern Israel, and the settlers are running rampant on the West Bank with the support of the idea. Yeah, uh, well, with the support of the IDF, is there? But that, or that also means that the Israeli state and the IDF are being backed by people like the Europeans and the British and the Americans who should know better. Implicitly, they're saying we will take no action about what's happening there, regardless you know, that we see it and we condemn it. The Hamas attack was was sort of Leninist. I mean, it was worse, it was more Leninist than Lenin was because it was also suicidal. Like Hamas will probably be destroyed um, as a functioning entity. The movement, the ideology of the movement might remain, but Hamas won't remain and most of its leaders and, and followers will be killed along with a lot of innocent people. But it was Leninist in the sense that Lenin, you know, things have to get worse before they get better. That was the, uh, that's the, the revolution will come when things get really terrible. And Hamas did everything it could to make things much more terrible. So again, the, the organizations you're talking about, they, they have no choice but to condemn what Hamas did and to focus on that. And then the question becomes, can you, um, can you demand of Israel that it has a proportionate response to what Hamas did? Now, A, even before this, forever, Israel has had a doctrine of disproportionate responses in or for the purposes they argued of deterrence. But B, this, this attack was so horrific, so many people were murdered, so many 
people lost relatives. There are so many hostages being held that Israel was not going to respond um, rationally to it. Uh, it's the same way the United States did not respond rationally to 9-11, which was a rather minor attack compared to, the, to relatively speaking to what Israel experienced. And, and Hamas knew that. So they were doing their damnedest to make everything as terrible as possible, including for the Palestinians. I mean, yeah, Israel's killed an awful lot of Palestinians who would be alive were it not for this attack. No question. Um, and Hamas knew that. And they're, they're, they're cool with that. So... Uh, the, the, well, the choice of words again, the fact that you call all of the victims uh, martyrs. I didn't call them martyrs. No, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm saying you in quote. Oh, the fact that, you know, the, uh, all of the, the dead, the dead are always martyrs. They're not just collateral damage. They're not victims of Israel. They are martyrs. They're active seekers for paradise. Right. Well, collateral damage is a terrible term, and, and martyrs is a terrible term, too. They are victims. They are victims of both Israel and Hamas and of the leadership of, of also the United States who, 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 have, who, who felt that... I mean, Israel had this terrible term for how it was handling Hamas in Gaza, which was mowing the law. Every few years, they felt they had to go into Gaza kill a few quote-unquote terrorists. I'll, I'll call them terrorists, but I agree, I understand a lot of people wouldn't do that. Um, a whole bunch of innocent civilians as they were killing the terrorists, knock down a bunch of buildings, take out some electoral grids, and just let everybody know who was boss, and then go back to life, and then Hamas maybe would kidnap someone, an Israeli soldier, and then trade them for the soldiers that were taken. And this could go on forever. And it was acceptable level of, of cost for Israel. Um, and, and everybody thought this was basically the way things are. This is the way things had to be. But of course, things were exploding inside of Gaza, the way people were forced to live there. It, it never got discussed in the United States. It, everybody was like, okay, things are contained. The Israelis, you know, if you go to Tel Aviv, I was in Tel Aviv last year and in, in Jaffa, which is a 50-50 city. It was wonderful. It was a great place to live. It's almost like Barcelona, Tel Aviv. But it's at the cost of this occupation that nobody had any reason particularly to think about except for the, the peace camp. And, and again, the Palestinians are saying, no, no, you can't, you can't live this way while we live this way. Edward Said, who I was, I was friends with, used to say when he went from the West Bank to to Israel, it was like driving from Bangladesh to Southern California. And uh, and the Palestinians are saying, no, you, you don't get to do that forever. But actually, Israel can do it forever because they're so much more powerful than the Palestinians. And I'm quite critical of the Palestinian leadership, historically, as well as now, because they, they have lost, this will be the 15th war that they have lost once it's over. And they act like they've won. They make, they make demands on the basis as if they can demand that Israel give them what they feel they're morally entitled to. But they have no means of enforcing that. And they haven't been willing to compromise uh, sufficiently based on, I, mean, I don't think most American, particularly American Jews, feel like Israel always acts morally and they feel like the United States always acts morally. I don't think morality has anything to do with great power politics. I think Israel acts on the basis of its own power to make itself as secure as it would like to be and to give its life the best citizens so that people keep voting for the politicians who deliver it. Same with the United States. So when the Palestinians argue, and, and their case is arguable, I, I share a lot of it, but a lot of people don't. Um, they say it's moral for us to bring us back to our homes and give us back our olive groves and our beautiful houses and pay us for our terrible things we've suffered. Uh, Israel says, how, how are you going to make us do that? And they can't. They can't. It's impossible. So, so the but Palestinians... There is a sort of theological element here, which you allude to in, the, in that, um, for example, one of the demands on the Palestinians for many years was not just that they pragmatically recognized that they'd lost and there were settlers on the, you know there were people had moved in and taken over the land that they're in but they had to accept that it was 
ethically and morally correct that this has happened. And th this is uh, to some extent what's happening now is that they're, they're, they're being, and they're not going to be prepared to. So many Palestinians might say, as you were talking pragmatically, that, uh, okay, we've got to come to moral comp to compromises, but then they're being asked to accept that it's, it's morally correct that they've been yes. defeated and moved. And I'm, I'm very critical. With the Israeli side as well as it, we, we are not just here because we won. We're here because it is our divine right to be here. And the, well, this is an element that's fairly new in great power. The demand, the demand is not for a divine right. I mean, there are some people who say that, but most people say we demand that you accept that Israel has a right to exist. That's the, the American Jewish position and, and the sort of pragmatic position. I disagree with that. I'm, I'm actually quite lonely in saying it's unreasonable to demand that people has say that Israel has a right to exist. I don't think nations have a right to exist. I think France doesn't have a right to exist. It exists. And and that actually the whole debate over Zionism I find enormously annoying. Zionism is fact is a fact Israel is a fact. It doesn't matter if you're pro-Zionist or anti-Zionist. There is a country called Israel. It's not going anywhere. You're not going to get rid of it. There's not going to be a Palestine from the river to the sea ever. So let's deal with the reality. Let's try and improve the lives of everybody who's living there. Let's make them safe and give them political uh, legitimacy and let them run their own lives, however we decide, however the best way to do that is. But the debate is so rhetorically driven, particularly in the United States, where people don't have a stake except in the rhetoric, that it's poisonous, which is actually why I wrote this book, because it's impossible to discuss this uh, between unless you have a 100% agreement with people, and I wanted to say here are here are the facts, here are the disagreements, here's the evidence for either side. Okay, now I'll deal with it. But um, you know, when I was at the Nation I, uh, for 25 years, I was the only person at the Nation who ever said Israel should, who, who never said Israel should just disappear. That's the solution. Israel's not going to disappear, even if I thought that. I mean, I'm not one of those people who thinks there has to be an Israel, but I do think that in 1948. There had to be a place for the 250,000 refugees left over from the Holocaust to go to, and there was no country that would accept them. And the Palestinians living in, the Arabs living in Palestine also would not accept them, understandably. They wanted to keep their country, I get it. But still, those people needed a place to go. The only place they could go was then Palestine. In order for that to happen, it turned out there needed to be a state of Israel. And since then, that state of Israel has had to protect itself. It, it does a lot more than protect itself. I don't support a lot of what, what it's doing, but it's pointless to say there shouldn't be an Israel any more than there shouldn't be a Mexico or there shouldn't be a, an Australia a, or a yeah. United States. It's yeah, a, Let, let's talk about what we can actually accomplish on behalf of the people who need our help. That's what I'm well, saying. This is where we come. And I was, uh, I, I, I wasn't surprised, but uh, it was disappointing. You didn't come up with any brilliant solutions. You actually come to pretty gloomy conclusions in the Apparently, book. I wasn't gloomy enough. I mean, yeah, I was pretty pessimistic, but not as pessimistic as I am today. <laughs> yeah, because essentially you're saying there's no way out, that uh, it's, it's immovable, unstoppable forces, immovable objects. Um, well, I've been saying for years, the only solution for this is for the Palestinians to become trustworthy to the Israelis. So that the Israelis will be willing to give the Palestinians a proper nation state, a proper pol polity, because that's the only people who can do it. The United States is incapable of forcing the Israelis to do that. No nation can force the Israelis to fundamentally uh, to fundamentally change their ways in terms of risking their their survival. No nation can do that. Uh, certainly not the United States. Israel, the United States can only get Israel to do anything. I mean, opening up that corridor is about the best the United States can do. They couldn't. If the United States said to Israel, no ground invasion, Israel would say tough luck, ground invasion. And the United States would, would accept that. So, so underestimate the theological element here because there's um, there are amongst the Israeli side, there is a theological 
psychopath psychopathology. They want to extinguish the memory of the Indians, of the, of, the, of the Palestinians, just the way that people here were exterminating memories of the Indians. They don't want to be reminded that there were people there before. You, you I don't think that's a mainstream view. I mean, there are some people like that, but I don't think it's a mainstream view. I think they, I think uh, my understanding of, of Israeli psychology is that they, they looked at Jewish history culminating in the Holocaust. Good people, people I, uh, I admire, like and admire, and said, you know, we Jews just don't have the luxury of looking at our position vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians in moral terms. The world has never cared the slightest bit about us. We, it was going to allow us to be eliminated in the worst genocide in history um, without doing a thing. So I'm sorry that, you know, Amos Oz and Edward Said both used the same metaphor of, uh, I think Amos Oz put it, uh, people jumping out of a burning building and landing on another person and, you know, kicking them out or killing them. Edward Said called the Palestinians victims of victims. Um, and I think the Israelis just felt like the, calc the moral calculations of our victims are not important in terms of setting up a place where Jews can finally be safe as they have never been throughout history, you know? And uh, I was in Spain this past summer. It's true, like in the year 600, the Spanish uh, cardinals all got together and said, our problem here is the Jews in 600. And there were not, not that many Jews there. Um, so, uh, so I think that's the driving force. And then, and since then, the issue has come up morally. It's a moral question, but the Israelis have decided that the world just doesn't care about you. And so we can't care about anybody but Jews. And you don't really need the theological element. It's true that in this government, it has come to matter a bit, but that's actually a function of the of how badly the left was disorganized in the last election. And the Arab party is not participating in it. This government was only elected by a margin of 30,000 people. And if the two leftist parties had gotten together, and if the Arab parties had gotten together as one party and participated fully, this government would not be this government. You would have had a very different government. Yeah, I've, I was in, when I went there, I was remonstrating, or not remonstrating, I was questioning my friends in East Jerusalem and saying, why don't you get the vote? It's a symbolic gesture, but it's a politically significant symbolic well, gesture. Well, that's the thing. The Palestinians have always been more interested in symbolism and rhetoric than in power politics. And, and I blame them for that. That's part Which of why comes down to the two-state solution. Why do you want to pocket Bantustan when um, it struck me at the time, and I was very unpopular with my Palestinian friends for saying, just tell them you want to vote. And if you'd done yep. it at an early stage, you wouldn't have been able to see the sky for the cloud of Israeli tanks withdrawing. <laughs> well, today, today up, from the up, river to the sea, up, up. the Palestinians are a majority. And if they had a vote, it, it would be Palestine, um, which means they won't get it. <laughs> exactly. uh, if, the Israel, if the Israelis have to choose between democracy and, and a Jewish state, they will pick a Jewish state. But it's still, it's still, it's still a, a strong argument and it and the threat of it you know the threat of a nonviolent movement demanding a vote would be very powerful and the united states and and uh european countries would have to re would have to respond to that and you know i've always felt like the only thing the palestinians could do because militarily all they can do is get themselves killed as as hamas is doing now um I've always thought that if Palestinians had like a general strike on the West Bank and inside Israel among the 150,000 Israeli Palestinians and, and, and nonviolent, like a lie down kind of thing, like the civil rights movement did in the United States, that the Israelis wouldn't be able to, they would have to come to the table. They couldn't, they couldn't kill people who were lying down and, and just refusing to do their jobs. The Israelis would have to come across and, and world Jewry would support that. Because World Jewry supports Israel because they fear the threat of history. Mm -hmm. um, can we and, come uh, okay. We're running, and uh, my friend Jeff Gold from Democratic Socialists, uh, 
as the electrically, uh, electorally active Social Democrat trying to flip House seats back to Democrats on Long Island, he's concerned about the deaths on both sides. But he's also worrying about losing differential Jewish votes in key constituencies uh, and wondering whether you have any observations. I mean, for many years, people like uh, Jerry Nadler had uh, sort of you know, somewhat tempered positions less progressive than you would have accepted because for electoral considerations. But this now applies also in places like Detroit, where people might be scared of uh, losing positions because of Arab votes. Uh, to what extent should this fit factor into the conversations? Um, well, this is complicated. This is kind of thing that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, I could take up all well, of our time. With this. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. Uh, before this attack, American Jews and Israeli Jews were dividing, were, were growing apart from each other significantly. Israeli Jews are, are quite conservative. American Jews are quite liberal. Young Israeli Jews are much more right wing than their parents and grandparents. Young American Jews are much more liberal than their parents and grandparents. Israel was the only country that preferred Donald Trump to Barack Obama and Joe Biden, the only putatively democratic country. Um, this attack has brought Jews back to Israel for the time being uh, because it's so shocking and because it, it feels like the Holocaust um, to a lot of people. Uh, so, um, and then there's this problem with APAC. APAC used to stay out of pretend to stay out of elections. And by pretending to stay out of elections, they played a much smaller role in elections. Then they started to in, in 2022, where they went after every progressive Democrat who did not support Israel and, and made the party less progressive. And now Democrats who are not 100% behind Israel who are calling for a ceasefire are gonna have an opponent in the Democratic primary supported by APEC. Um, APAC has become a really right-wing force in American politics. Mike Johnson, this theocratic nut, in my opinion, uh, who is now Speaker of the House, uh, his largest contributor is APAC. Um, so, uh, so yeah, for the time being, supporting saying anything critical of Israel is going to be very dangerous in Congress. Uh, for anyone, with the possible exception of a congressman from certain parts of Michigan, where there's a large Palestinian population. But uh, yeah, uh, by the way, I live in Jerry Nadler's district. I think he's always been more right wing towards Israel than the district is. The district is pretty evenly divided. Um, I think he could I think he could catch a break. But it, look, APAC and, and, and the various lobbies for Israel, many of whom which are not Jewish, are very powerful. And the lobbies that would like to uh, restrain Israel and uh, give more support to the Palestinians are not powerful at all. And that's Jeff what politics Gold is just, about. Jeff Gold that's, what politi that's politics. That's what it is. Jeff Gold has just put in a disclaimer. He, uh, like many people, left DSA because they were uh, they're somewhat like uh, their, 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 their strange attitude to Ukraine. <laughs> and uh, so it's. Uh, which well, the, um, is this similar because it's theology and ideology over reality and morality. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we want to get into Ukraine. No, I think um, it's late in the day for Ukraine. Martin Reynolds says uh, Noam Chomsky has asserted the United States has the influence to direct Israel more explicitly. Um, why should Israel be afforded the position to grant Palestinians moral political standing? Given the hard right shift on the part of the country, that seems unlikely. How is that just? Who said it was just? Who said it was just? Did anyone here say it was just? I nope. said it's political reality. Noam Chomsky's wrong, by the way. But I've often find that no. Even, even if even if the United States cut Israel off entirely, Israel would still do. Israel's a very wealthy country. It could do what it wants to do. The United States, I mean, it's politi it'd be political suicide. For the United States, for American president to say we're cutting Israel off, so that's not going to happen. But even if in some alternate universe it happened, Israel would still do what it wanted to do. It's it's it 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 never does what Israel can. Israel is not quite powerful powerful enough to force 
an American president to do what Israel wants it to do, but it is powerful enough to refuse to do what an American president wants it to do. So it's yeah. not, it's not, it doesn't have limitless power in American politics, but it's got a lot of power. Noam Chomsky is one of the only people in the world who thinks that Israel is a US satellite carrying out US imperialist motives in the Middle East as far as I know. No, it's much more the, the tail that wags the dog. Exactly, yes. Frank Gomez says, are there any realistic prospects for change in the rigid actor's attitude to the polarization going forward? And if so, what factors will bring change about? So we've already set the gloomy background for that. I can be even gloomier than I've been. The Torah, <laughs> the Torah says that the sins of the fathers will be visited upon the sons for three generations. I think this Hamas attack is worth three generations of horrible relations between Israel and Palestine. Um, but you don't think that the vigorous counter reaction from Israel is going to harden attitudes the other way as well? That's what I mean. Both sides um, are, are, are in for uh, generations of hatred and an unwillingness to compromise. Mm. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> you you can't apologize for reality. It's not your fault. I know, but you're supposed to you're supposed to end on an optimistic note, and I don't have one. I can't see one. Armageddon is not an optimistic note, and yeah. Well, I mean, I the great hope, that. the best we can hope for now is that we don't get a war with Hezbollah, which will be the most destructive war of all time in the Middle East, and could very easily lead. Netanyahu to attack Iran um, because he might see that as politically expedient as a way to save himself. And then who knows where that could be. So that's the best I think we can hope for that this war is contained. Yeah, I keep all across the world, I keep seeing Sarajevo 1914 triggers waiting again. Um, this is. Yeah, you might, you might be right. I haven't. I mean, that's, that's, that's the fear. That's the fear. Well, look, we're coming towards the end now. I, this is the Foreign Press Association in New York, and we've had Eric Altman in a, a gloomy and dispassionate and objective um, view of uh, the Middle East, which is consistent and not just based on recent terrible events, but uh, on a long time study and uh, since I've been studying it for roughly the same time, I tend to agree with him as well. I really look for silver linings in the clouds, but if I see a silver lining, it's probably an electromagnetic pulse. From some <laughs> <laughs> a shock, a shock from the cord on your computer. Yes. Uh, so this is uh, this is the book you should go and get. Much neglected by the people who should comment on it. We are not one by uh, David Alderman. Basic books. And Eric Alterman. Uh, Eric Alterman. Eric Alterman. Sorry. It's the King David. Not my cousin David. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, I invite you to put your name down with us. We are resuming normal service after a slight gap. And as I said, coming up soon will be Marsha Cup on um, Orwell in the Soviet Union. And the more I read this, my studies of Orwell uh became in because thought crime hate crime two minutes hate all of these uh totalitarian say technologies seem to be being deployed on all sides in it and um especially the double think du double think is the currency of the day um I'll leave you with that pessimistic thought uh eric wanted us to have an optimistic one but he, if he can't provide one i'm not going to try <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Eric. And thank uh, you for having me. May Bye -bye. your book sell and make it worthwhile for you, at least. From your mouth to God's ears. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye.